the presentations during the conference, but I heard uh, a good many of them, and uh, I thought they were outstanding um, presentations. Uh, I, I had a lot that I agreed with, I had a lot that I disagreed with, uh, but everything uh, that I heard um, uh, made me uh, think more about the, uh, the issues that we have been discussing, and I think that's uh, what happens when um, a conference uh, has uh, very good participants in it who, um, who speak uh, thoughtfully and, and knowledgeably. Um, the, the keynote speaker uh, for this conference uh, is also the concluding speaker uh, for this conference, and I think we're very fortunate uh, to have Nicholas Burns uh, join us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Nicholas Burns is a uh, professor of diplomatic practice and international politics at the, uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, he has uh, served as uh, Under Secretary of State uh, for Political Affairs. Uh, he has held a uh, great variety of other uh, important foreign policy positions. He served as ambassador to Greece. He served as ambassador to NATO. Uh, he served uh, presidents uh, of uh, both political parties, and I would say that uh, there are uh, very few, uh, if any, um, uh, American diplomats who are as highly regarded uh, as Nicholas Burns, and I think we're very fortunate to have him here this afternoon. So, uh, Mr. Burns. Aria, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. I had the pleasure of sitting in on that last panel. It was fascinating. Um, I wanted to say a word about um, sanctions as a function of diplomacy. The conference is on sanctions and divestment. Um, I'm not here to speak about divestment simply because I'm not an expert on divestment or some of the particular issues that have been in the news recently, but I know a little bit about sanctions because I was a practicing diplomat as Arya said, for 27 years uh, for the United States. And when I thought about this conference and actually just sitting here thinking about the issues involving sanctions internationally, I see sanctions as closely related to diplomacy uh, because sanctions, after all, are an instrument of diplomacy. I think diplomacy is important, understatement of the year, but particularly for Americans, and I think particularly since 9-11. Sometimes when countries are great military powers, it's easier in deciding what to do in the world, if we intervene or not, if we elect to involve ourselves in a civil conflict or a civil war, it's easier sometimes to devolve to the use of force because it's there, because you're competent at it, because you're so much more powerful than another country. And it's important especially for the most powerful country in the world, and we still are the most powerful military in the world, it's important for us to understand and to grasp the fact that uh, sometimes it's in our better interest to seek the way forward through diplomatic means. Through negotiations, certainly, using our political influence in the world, sometimes by making decision, difficult decisions, engaging an adversary. That's difficult to do. It's difficult for us, it was difficult for Yitzhak Rabin to shake Yasser Arafat's hand on the White House lawn in September 1993. It's been very difficult, I think, for both the George W. Bush and Barack Obama administrations to think about negotiations with Iran. We've had a 35-year separation and divorce with Iran. But diplomacy has got to be our first impulse, not the use of military force. Uh, Colin Powell used to say that our diplomatic assets have to be on point, our military in reserve. And in, at least in my view, in a way, after 9-11, we sometimes reverse that and thought about the use of force first. And so the first point I wanted to make, Arya, is that I think that sanctions should be seen, at least in a state-to-state -state basis, as part of diplomacy, in essence, as part of negotiations. Second point is that sanctions, of course, and I'm not a sanctions expert, but I've thought about them and have been involved, of course, in decisions to use sanctions are often not successful. I think if we did a New School or Harvard project and tried to look at 
you know, 40 or 50 conflicts over the last half century, you'd be hard pressed to find more than a few where sanctions were undeniably effective in achieving the means for which they were intended. An obvious example, and came up in the last panel a little bit, is the, is the sanctions against South Africa, the white apartheid regime in South Africa in the 1980s. I think with the benefit of hindsight, but maybe we didn't even need the benefit of hindsight, the United States was too late to that effort. We were the last major country, along with the United Kingdom, to join in the international sanctions of the 1980s. With the benefit of hindsight, perhaps sanctions should have been used much earlier, decades earlier, to end a regime that I think everybody now considers to have been an evil regime, the Nationalist Party, the white Afrikaner movement uh, that enslaved through apartheid the majority population in South Africa. I think there's little question that the sanctions imposed on that white regime in the 80s had a major impact in convincing them first to release Nelson Mandela from prison in February of 1990, and then to begin the negotiations, the four-year negotiations between Mandela and de Klerk that led to the multi-racial, uh, multi-party elections, and of course the victory in those elections of Mandela and of the new state. A second example, in my view, where sanctions have been successful is Iran. Just over the last couple of years, uh, I was uh, Under Secretary of State, as Arya said, for Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice between 2005 and 2008, and one of the early assignments that she asked me to undertake was to be the Iran negotiator. Now, lest you think that was more than what it was, let me tell you that in those three years, I never met an Iranian. Uh, not because I didn't want to, but because it was U.S. policy at the time that we would not meet Iranians, and it was Iranian policy that they refused to meet us. As you remember, say, the winter, spring of 2005, the second term, the beginning of the second term of George W. Bush, we were in the middle of two very difficult, increasingly unpopular, uh, increasingly bloody wars. The occupation of Iraq had run into major problems by 2005, self-evident. The Taliban had, was picking up in Afghanistan momentum in opposing, by violence, both the Afghan government uh, and the U.S. NATO forces, thereby U.N. Security Council resolution, by the way, blessed by the international community, but both wars in a very difficult state. And the question was, what do you do about Iran, in Iran that was, I think, in a self-evident way, heading towards a nuclear weapons capability? Nobody thought otherwise. The Russians and Chinese, the Europeans all assumed, as did we, that the Iranians ultimately wanted to acquire nuclear weapons. So the policy question was, by which means would you prevent that from happening? And I think to her credit, uh, Condi Rice believed that before we thought about the use of force, we ought to try diplomacy. At that point, you know, it had been 26, 27 years since the breakdown of our relationship in the late 1970s, when the Shah was overthrown, when the Khomeini regime came in, when between November 1979 and January 1981, that Iranian regime held 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. It was at that point we broke diplomatic relations and we had not had any sustained contact with that regime from the late 1970s to the mid, uh, to 2005, 2006. We had had episodic contacts at the UN, maybe a desultory meeting in Geneva, but never a sustained conversation and frankly, as we thought about it, it just didn't make sense. It did not make sense that you would actually think about the use of force against a country with which you had had no contact. Uh, I certainly believe then, as I believe now, that you've got to try to negotiate first. At the very least, you want to get a sense of what the other country's objectives are. Is there even a small possibility that you might make progress some negotiated agreement that leaves you well short of a war. That was undeniably the right decision uh, made by George W. Bush and made by Condoleezza Rice. So in 2006 and seven, we actually joined forces with the Russian government, the Chinese government, the British, French, and German government, so the Perm Five Plowers in Germany. We formed a negotiating group on the Iran issue and we offered negotiations before we thought about sanctions. 
uh, and in, two, in June of 2006 in Vienna, made a public offer, all those countries to Iran, please negotiate on this issue of nuclear weapons. The Iranians turned us down, renewed that uh, offer to negotiate in 2007. In fact, here in New York at the UN General Assembly in uh, the autumn of 2007, turned down again. When it became apparent to us, including the Russians and Chinese, that the Iranians modernizing their enrichment program clearly developing a ballistic missile capacity, clearly acting out, if you will, by very aggressive policies, military policies in the Middle East, we're heading towards a nuclear weapons capability. We decided, and we meaning the Russians, Chinese, Europeans, and Americans, that if they weren't going to negotiate, we would try to pass UN Security Council Chapter 7 sanctions resolutions to do a couple of things. And here's where sanctions, I think, can sometimes be beneficial. When there's effectively an outlaw state, and I'm not trying to be too critical, I'm no fan of the Iranian regime, so I don't mind being critical, but it was an outlaw state. It was heading towards a nuclear weapons capability when nobody in the world wanted it to. So in December 06, in March 07, and in March 08, we passed, the international community, three Chapter 7 sanctions resolutions against the Iranians. They were not blunt sanctions. They were not comprehensive sanctions, and they really weren't even economic sanctions. They were targeted on the Iranian leadership. They were targeted at the people who worked in the nuclear industries, the engineers and scientists. They were travel sanctions. There were military sanctions. They were sanctions designed to impinge upon the Iranian government's ability to move forward. I think ultimately the power of these sanctions, the greatest effect really, was the fact that the entire international community, that point, probably 193 members of the UN system, and I think now we have 195, were saying together to Iran, what you are doing is objectionable to the entire world. And if you won't even come to negotiations with the permanent five countries of the Security Council, we're going to have to sanction you. And I thought it was appropriate, especially under Chapter 7, as you know, Chapter 7 sanctions uh, mean that all member states of the UN are obligated to implement those sanctions. So they have a lot more power than, say, Chapter 6 sanctions, which are advisory, or an, a resolution of General Assembly would just would be a political statement without any muscle behind it. We were under no illusions back in 05, 06, 07, 08 that these sanctions would compel the Iranians as a matter of self-interest to come to the negotiating table, but we helped it would show them that they really were isolated, that not even Russia or China was going to protect them, that at some point we had to have a negotiation. Now, the use of force was available to the United States. But I'm very, well, I'm very pleased that President Bush and President Obama have decided not to use force. I'm a diplomat by DNA, as well as a diplomat by training and experience, and I think that we are almost always better off by negotiating first, and, and only when you fail, and there's really no alternative, and if you think your vital interests are at stake, or the health of the country, or the welfare of the country is at stake, would you turn to the use of military force? And now we've had a Republican president and a Democratic president follow this basic policy that we're not going to, they both say, allow Iran to actually become a nuclear weapons power. We're prepared to use instruments, sanctions to coerce, to leverage, to isolate, to punish, if you will, in anticipation that the cost of those sanctions would rise so that then the calculus of the Iranian regime would change and they would think it in their interest to negotiate. That didn't happen in the early years because the sanctions were not profoundly um, weighty. They were more symbolic. But when President Obama came into office, and you all remember, I remember his first inaugural speech, clear as a bell, the most memorable part of it for me was when, I can't remember if he raised his fist, but when he said, if you have a clenched fist, if you unclench it, I'll meet you. you know, essentially he was saying, I'll meet you halfway. I think he was talking to the North Koreans and the Iranians. These regimes with which we had been completely isolated and separated. And President Obama came into office with a policy of engagement, and he made every opportunity to engage the Iranian leadership. And the Iranians turned him down in 2009, especially after the spring, the June elections, the stolen elections, really, of 2009, when there was the People's Rebellion 
against those stolen elections. There was a rigidification in the Iranian regime. They closed off the avenues of dialogue and cooperation and refused negotiations again. And it was that, that was the critical part, I think, in the use of sanctions. Because they went from the symbolic sanctions that I'd been involved with as a negotiator between 05 and 08 to powerful sanctions. The US Congress and the US government, by executive action, passed financial sanctions, which essentially cut Iran off from the international banking system. The European Union imposed similar financial sanctions, as well as an oil and gas embargo. And the Europeans were major importers of Iranian energy, which prohibited the importation of Iranian oil and gas into Europe. And then beyond those sanctions, Europe and the US used their influence with India, Japan, South Korea, to encourage those countries to diminish their purchases of Iranian oil. And suddenly, the Iranians lost a million barrels a day of exports of energy, of oil and gas. The value of the real, the currency, d diminished by 50% uh, in 2011 and 12, I think it was. And you could really see these sanctions having an impact. Now, I think they had an impact on the thinking of the Iranian government, because by 2013, and particularly after President Rouhani won the elections, uh, a, a reformist regime, the Iranians were, in essence, suing for peace. And that led to the very first US-Iran substantive conversations in a generation uh, between President Obama, his, his government, not him personally, and the Iranian regime. It's led to the current nuclear negotiations. And we're clearly better off now jousting with the Iranians at the negotiating table than, than we were um, prior to that. So I do credit sanctions with having a major impact on the calculations and thinking of the Iranian government. And frankly, one of the reasons why I believe we have the negotiating advantage as we look towards this June 30 deadline on the nuclear talks is that the Iranians need an agreement more than the United States or Europe needs an agreement. Uh, that economy runs on carbon and the export of carbon, of minerals, of oil, of gas, and they cannot have a successful economy without that. And right now, they're completely isolated and, and, and shut off. And so, if you will, I think that sanctions have been virtuous in this respect. They've allowed us to avoid the use of force. We've, we've really put it aside, the United States. And they've allowed us to focus on diplomacy. They maneuvered Iran to the negotiating table. And if we can get an agreement, and I support President Obama, in pursuing these negotiations, we will clearly be better off than we were. We, we, we would be entertaining the possibility of a big war or the use of air power. And that, of course, once you start a war, Churchill said, you, you don't know when it's going to end, how it's going to end. We found that out in bitter experience in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So I would say sanctions have been effective so far. Now, the, you do have to look, of course, at the human impact. I've been talking on a state-to-state -state basis about the impact that a sanctions had on the government of Iran. Obviously, sanctions against the Iranian government have an impact on the Iranian people. And this is the difficult part of it for anyone involved in advocating the use of sanctions. You know there's going to be a human cost. You know there's going to be a cost to average people who bear no responsibility for the actions of their government, in this case, the Iranian government. Um, you have to choose. As President Obama and President Bush have chosen, I think in this case, if we can deny Iran a nuclear weapon, and that would change the political map of the Middle East for worse if they acquired one, and certainly endanger the Sunni Arab states first and foremost, and Israel as well. If you can deny them that, I think the sanctions have to be worth it, despite the cost to average Iranians. We could talk about the sanctions imposed on Saddam Hussein between the two wars. They had a major impact, and sometimes cruelly, cruel impact, on average Iraqis. We wanted them to have an impact on Saddam Hussein, but of course they have an impact on people as well. The second example I thought I'd cite today was the example of Russia over the last 13 months. Since the last weekend of the Sochi Olympics, late February 2014, when target of opportunity, when President Yanukovych fled in the middle of the night, left his post, left the country, vacuum of power in Kiev, filled by the opponents of President Yanukovych, when President Putin put Russian military forces into Crimea, and then did what no major government has done in Europe since the Nazis 
invade another country, take part of its territory, and formally annex it, which is an outright violation of the United Nations Charter of International Law, at that point there had to be a response. The crime committed, crossing a national border, gobbling up a part of someone else's country, and then digesting it, formally annexing it by act of the Russian Duma, there had to be a response. And I, I'm a private citizen like I think most of you, all of you are. I don't know what the Obama-Merkel conversations were like, but I know what the result of them was. Neither Germany, and Germany in a way has been the lead actor here because of the relationship between Germany and Russia, which is so intensive economically. Neither Chancellor Merkel nor President Obama believed it was wise, just to use military force against Russia because of the Russian annexation of Crimea. That was absolutely the right decision. We have no security obligation to Ukraine, and Ukraine is not a member of NATO. We have no ethical obligation. We've never promised the Ukrainians that we would defend them by the use of military force. Uh, and given the fact that Russia is a nuclear weapons power, the strongest in the world, along with the United States, it would have been a catastrophic mistake to have chanced a war between Russia and the West where the use of nuclear weapons could never be excluded. So they made the right decision. But if you then make the right decision, here's where sanctions come back. Where's your leverage? How can you do what you have to do? Protest to Putin, drive up the costs, push back a little, try to cause him to recalculate the way he's thinking. You look around for your levers, there are very few. Sanctions was the most obvious. And you saw how difficult that is, because Putin, of course, being an autocrat, was quick, agile, always two or three steps ahead, and that's no criticism. It's really, I say that sympathetically to Chancellor Merkel and President Obama, they're Democrats, small d. They have legislatures, they have the press, they have citizens commenting, so they can't move as fast. But it became clear that the European Union, Canada, which was an important actor in this, given the number of Ukrainian Canadians uh, and the long-standing ties between Canada and Ukraine. Canada, the US, and Europe had to decide, what do we do? And you could see this dynamic where the Canadians and Americans wanted to push for very tough sanctions and the Europeans for quite mild sanctions because, relatively speaking, the Canadians and Americans, our economic interests in Russia are not as vast, not nearly as intertwined as, as those between the European Union countries and Russia, particularly Germany, Italy, Netherlands, countries with, with very important economic ties. And so they were kind of lowest common denominator sanctions, choosing nine people around Putin and saying to them, you can no longer vacation in, in, in the Côte d'Azur. You can't visit London or Paris or Washington. You know, picking out oligarchs and trying to close down their bank accounts. I mean, there were, these were very modest sanctions. They were highly symbolic. It's hard to say they had an impact. Uh, on the Russian government, particularly on President Putin. But then, with the shootdown of the Malaysian civil airliner in mid-July of last summer, clearly that was the Russian ethnic, the pro-Russian rebels who shot that plane down and then lied about it afterwards. Everything points to that. That turned public opinion in Europe against the Russian regime and in favor of doing something what was the something? Sanctions. Sanctions as an instru instrument of diplomacy. Sanctions as conflict by other means, not open conflict, but registering disapproval, registering isolation, a sense of isolation, registering a punitive action. I don't think these sanctions by themselves have made a decisive impact on Putin, but at the same time as the sanctions were being put on, of course, the price of oil dropped. The Russians price oil, depending on who you talk to, it's somewhere around $100 a barrel, meaning they've got to have that price in order to be able to balance their budget, build up their reserves, fund their social safety net, fund their military programs. And as oil has been in the 50s and 60s, the Russians have been bleeding money. And I think in this case, it's really the reductions in the price of oil market forces that more than the sanctions have begun to hit the Russian economy, as Nina Khrushcheva said in the last panel, pretty hard. And I think President Putin, who's a very smart man, he's brutal, 
calculating, uh, cynical, but smart, understands that Russia cannot live in isolation from the West, particularly the Europeans. It is interwoven economically with them, the export of Russian natural gas west, the importation of manufactured goods from Europe into Russia. And one would hope that the combination of the fall of oil, the price of oil, and the sanctions will drive the Russians to a more uh, reasonable policy where they stop using the military means to divide Ukraine. One would hope, but I guess I'm cynical about the Russians, about this particular group of Russians leading the Russian government, and I think that even this morning, uh, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times are reporting that NATO said publicly yesterday they believe the Russians are preparing for another major offensive in eastern Ukraine. If that happens, then I think the European Union will decide this summer to maintain the sanctions. They have to make a decision this summer. Do we maintain the sanctions or do we take them off? And 28 countries have to all decide by consensus to maintain the sanctions. So you can see what the Russians have been doing diplomatically, inviting the Greek prime minister to Moscow, uh, the Cypriot prime minister, close relations with the Hungarians and Bulgarians, those four countries, if one of them defects, the EU sanctions will end. Those who are in favor of a continuation of sanctions, the Germans, for instance, will have a stronger hand politically in the debate. If the Russians continue to operate behind the scenes in Ukraine to divide the country, I believe they are doing so. So I would say in our time in the last decade, these are the two primary examples. Iran and Russia, where sanctions have been perhaps not conclusively effective because we're really at midpoint in both dramas. The Iranian nuclear drama, we don't know how the story is going to end. Certainly not, don't know how the story in Ukraine with Russia is going to end. But sanctions have been used, I think, rather effectively, more so in Iran than Ukraine, but both effectively by the international community, the United Nations, the European Union, major states like the U.S., to be able to manage a difficult conflict without resort to the use of force. And so as a career diplomat, now I teach diplomacy, international politics, foreign policy. Uh, I try to talk to, well, I talk to my students and we investigate. How do you combine these different instruments, negotiations, threats of force, sanctions, to maneuver and leverage countries to where you want them to go, to the negotiating table? And I think that they've been used in a sophisticated way in both instances with Iran and Russia. And I hope ultimately they'll be, they'll be successful. So I thank the New School for uh, holding this conference because I think so little attention is paid to the use of sanctions. Um, as a diplomat and as a professor, it's part of the craft. It's also used by not just nation states, it's by the entire international community, this would be my last point, by the United Nations not far from here, to express universal values, sanctions are. So the sanctions against a major human rights violator, think of the actions or the inactions of the Sudanese government uh, when women and children were being assaulted in Darfur for a number of years, you sanction to register universal disapproval, either by resolution in the General Assembly, that's a declaration, or by an act, Chapter 7, Security Council sanctions. If there's an outlaw state, and clearly North Korea is an outlaw state, it's acquired a nuclear weapons force, they have nuclear weapons, unlike Iran, which aspires to have them. Uh, the North Koreans are sanctioned by almost everybody, with the exception of the Chinese and a few other countries because their actions are so clearly divergent from what everybody else thinks and what from the United Nations think. And so they're also, in an important symbolic way, a way for the international community that may not have the means to correct the problem of human rights violations in North Korea or Sudan, but to say to them, there will be a penalty. That, you know, we do have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and we all have to be accountable to it. And if the UN can speak with one voice, it can be very powerful. The problem, of course, with the UN is it rarely speaks with that one voice. It never really did during the Cold War when the East and West were separated into competitive blocks. And in recent years, since we passed those UN Security Council sanctions resolutions against Iran in 06, 07, and 08, and again one in 2010, 
After 2011, the Libya, uh, NATO's Libya action, the Russians and Chinese have shut down the possibility of using sanctions in the Security Council against the Syrian government. The Syrian government is firing barrel bombs into civilian neighborhoods in Aleppo, uh, in the suburbs of Damascus. 260,000 people have been killed by the Syrian government and the rebel groups, the many rebel groups. The UN is silent on these outrages because effectively you have the Russians, Chinese versus the French, British, and Americans over in Turtle Bay, and they're effectively neutralizing each other. The UN cannot speak with one voice, and that's a great pity when we invest so many hopes uh, that the United Nations can be an effective instrument to, to act and to register disapproval when it's necessary to do so. So I didn't come to speak about divestment because I don't have anything intelligent to say. I haven't reflected broadly on a lot of those issues, but I've tried to think about sanctions. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words today. I'm very happy to take any questions. Ari, I don't, I don't know whether you want to have a conversation or whether uh, I should just sit down I and try answer one questions. one question uh, on you and then uh, op open things up. Um, you did mention that uh, the sanctions have uh, a severe impact on uh, the Iranian people who are not themselves uh, responsible um, for the, uh, the actions of their government. And I, I have an ongoing argument with uh, a friend about uh, sanctions with respect to, uh, to North Korea. Um, his uh, position is that there has been uh, starvation uh, in uh, North Korea, uh, that that's one of the, um, the consequences of the, um, uh, the sanctions, and that at the very least, um, we ought to be shipping food um, to North Korea to try to, um, uh, to deal with the problem of, of starvation. And then the issue um, comes, well, uh, we know that the North Koreans have taken food shipments and used them for their military. His position uh, is, yes, but some of the food will get through to the, uh, to the starving uh, population, even if they siphon off uh, a great quantity of it uh, for the military. Uh, do, do you feel that when issues of that sort arise with respect to sanctions, uh, that those who impose um, sanctions um, have certain obligations. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. I'll start on your last sentence. Of course, we definitely have an obligation to consider when we um, suggest, promote, conclude sanctions, the impact on innocent people, people who cannot be held responsible for the actions of a government. Uh, in the case of Iran, in the case of Iraq between the wars, in the case of North Korea. Um, and, and this is where government becomes difficult, whether it's at the Security Council or in the White House. Um, as you know, sometimes the choices are bad and worse. It's not good and bad. There's no white or black set of options. So there's certainly a social political value in stopping uh, the Iranian government from becoming a nuclear weapons power. Do, how do you weigh that value against the clear down impact, negative impact, that some sanctions will have on average Iranians. And you do have to weigh it. You have to consider it if, you're a, if you have a conscience. And our I, I use the example of North Korea, because there you. there was um, you know, starvation. Yeah. Iran wasn't in danger of anything of that sort. There could be a severe impact of the sanctions on the Iranian population. But the situation was not so desperate uh, in Iran that uh, there would be catastrophic consequences. Right. And it, I was going to get to that North Korea. I just wanted to make a general yeah. point first, and that is that outside of a clear question, and I think North Korea is clear, and I'll answer that in a minute, even when you're not quite sure what the impact of sanctions might be, say Iran, you still have to think through it. Mm -hmm. um, even you have to think through it from the perspective, are we going to drive the population towards its own government? A population that seems to be very well disposed towards the US is the Iranian population. So you have to consider the impact, political but human. In the case of North Korea, uh, I don't know whether it's possible to conclude that starvation in North Korea, and there's clear signs in the last 20 years of starvation, uh, not just food shortages, but starvation. 
that that's been caused by the sanctions or by the, incredible, by the isolation and economic policies of the government. But putting that aside, if there is starvation, every administration that I know of since the Bill Clinton administration has sanctioned North Korea and yet supported food shipments to North Korea. President Clinton did, President Bush did, President Obama has. And the instrument of the food um, support has been the World Food Program of the United Nations. Josette Sheeran, who's now president of the Asia Society uh, here in New York, was director of that program. And that, the U.S. has been the leading donor to that program of food, and we have actively supported the um, supply of food to North Korea, knowing that some of it will end up on the black market inside North Korea, some to the military, but that some can get through. And so we have supported that, we, to answer your question very directly. Okay, uh, let me open this up to, uh, to others who want to, uh, to ask questions. Come to the microphone, please. And uh, as much as possible, yeah, please, sure. uh, in, in the form short. of a very question. Short. Very short. So it was quite a brilliant presentation, but I wonder how completely you have made the transition from diplomat uh, to professor. I just mentioned two examples. Uh, one example is uh, your ready definition of Iran uh, or any other state as an outlaw state. And I, I want to know the criteria because it can't be that it's just a violation of international laws, which we know some of our friends also are greatly, uh, uh, have uh, greatly violated, nor can it be building uh, a you know, nuclear uh, a capability in the Middle East because some of our friends have done that already. Uh, so I just wonder how is it that so quickly you say outlaw state in one case and not uh, raise it in the other. And my other question is, uh, I just, after the Iraq war, which I studied a great deal and written about it, I'm really wondering about your great confidence in our, in our military capability. I mean, you seem to be implying that, of course, if we wanted to do that, we could do that. I think a war against Iran is not within your capability. Thank you very, thank you very much. Do you want to answer uh, Maybe these just, questions, or do you want to take uh, others as well? How do you, uh, I, would, I, would, you I think I'd just like to answer them consecutively. Right. I think it's probably easier. Thank you for your questions, yeah. both very good questions. On the first, I plead guilty. Uh, I, maybe I haven't made a total transition from being an American diplomat I, to a professor. I'm an American, very proud of our country, and was proud to represent it. So I'm not an objective bystander. I tend to see things through the prism of my government but I'm not, an un, I'm not uncritical of my government either as a private citizen, I will tell you. On the Iran question, are they an outlaw state? Yeah. If the UN Security Council passes four Chapter 7 resolutions, essentially saying to the Iranians, you are completely out of line. This is the Security Council, not the US government. This is Russia and China. And what you're doing is anathema to us, and you must stop, and we're going to sanction you if you don't. There's very few countries that get that treatment. Israel, Israel does not get that treatment and should not get that treatment. There is trust, basically, that the Israelis are responsible stewards of their power. There's no trust in the Iranians. I'm, I'm saying there's no trust in Moscow or Beijing. How many Security Council resolutions have they violated? So I will just continue my answer. <laughs> okay. um, and so, yes, they're an outlaw regime. Second. Um, the second question was, um, why am I confident in the ability of the U.S. military? In this case, um, I think if you look at what kind of, if you did use military force against Iran, what would you do? I, I don't know a single person anywhere, not even John Bolton, who believes that we should invade Iran uh, militarily by conventional force. What, what people have been talking about in the press, in academic fora like this is, would the United States or Israel use military air power, not to defeat Iran, but to target its nuclear, its, its ability to mine, convert, and enrich uranium, to knock it back on the continuum, to delay its program. But in that case, the use of air power, if you think about it, would be tactical designed to support diplomacy. You'd be using air power to get them to come back to the table. I think President Bush and President Obama have been right not to use air power, by the way and they've been right to negotiate. But does the U.S. military have the capability to do it? Yes, they do. And I hope the Iranians keep that in the back of their minds. And you, you know, you, if you threaten force credibly, and we have, 
and you combine that with sanctions, then you've got enough leverage that maybe diplomacy can work. Because the Iranians aren't there out of charity at the negotiating table. They're there because we've driven the price up, the cost to them. Thank you for your question. Yes. Thanks, Professor Burns. As a former student of yours, I think you transitioned to being a professor fine. Thank um, you. <laughs> anyway, my question is, um, when you were speaking about South Africa and how the US and the UK were late to the game, you spoke about hindsight. And I'm wondering, when do you think hindsight kicks in? Or in other words, when we do find that our policies or our relations with certain states are or have been wrong or misled or misguided, how can we backtrack so as not to be on the wrong side of history? It's a great question. Zaina was one of our terrific students at the Kennedy School, now graduated, is working here in New York, so thank you for the question. Um, it's a great question, and I don't know if there's an adequate answer to it. Um, I think we all have an obligation, whether we're in the university or in government, to examine our motives, uh, in government to examine um, our policies. When you leave, you have an obligation to look back and say, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? And clearly, you know, I love our country, but we've made a series of mistakes on a lot of issues. We're highly imperfect. Uh, so as you know, and Zaina was a student in my class, I look back with great respect uh, to what the decisions made by President Bush in 03, and I think I supported them as a diplomat. I supported the invasion of Iraq. I now believe, with the benefit of hindsight, that was a mistake uh, to invade Iraq. I su so uh, you have to look back and try to answer the questions so that hopefully there's a process in our country, in our political system, in the White House to say, can we learn from these, can we learn from these mistakes? I think there's no question that President Obama, when he ran in 08 and in 12, his campaigns were fueled really by his assessment of what went wrong in Iraq. Uh, and he wanted to get us out of Iraq. So here's an interesting conundrum that I'll leave you with. And I mentioned it to my class this semester when we talked about Iraq. I clearly think objectively that as a matter of the national interest, we should not have gone into Iraq in 2003. But here's the problem. Once we were there, we occupied it, we owned it. Colin Powell said, you know, the pottery barn rule kicked in. If you break it, you own it. I also kind of think now that we were wrong. We were wrong to go in in 03. We were wrong to leave in 2011. When we left, we left a very weak Iraqi government on their own. Iran became the kingpin in Baghdad. That government became exceedingly Shia in orientation. It drove the Sunni away, and the Islamic State has now occupied a third of Iraq, in part because we weren't there to counsel the government in Baghdad to be more open and more inclusive to Sunni representation and to train that army to stand up to a far inferior force at Mosul. So honestly, I think we were wrong to leave as maybe well as wrong to go in. I don't think that's a contradiction. It's just how complicated these issues are. So yes, we have to learn from history and be honest about our mistakes when we make them. Thank you, Zaina. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, I think maybe you're going to find my question um, really nice, but I really want to do it and like tell you, and because I want to hear your answer, is um, when you say we first have to negotiate and then use the military force, what is exactly the criteria that make you think that you have to do something? Uh, because in these general talks, I have the feeling that um, we are confusing, or at least it's not clear for me, uh, that we're confusing the United States government and the state politics with the international organisms of uh, human rights. Thank you. So thank you for your question. And um, I would say that um, what gives us the right to act? Yeah, um, that's, in other words, what you're asking? Yeah, what is the criteria? Because criteria. when you say, um, it seems that you have it really clear that for you it's really natural, but I want to know the, like, the criteria. Well, yeah, we'll read. thank you. So what are the criteria? Let's take the Iran nuclear as an example. Just that's probably easier to speak specifically. In the case of Iran, 
Uh, the U.S. has concluded, Democrats and Republicans, all administrations, really since President Kennedy's, that it's not in our, in it is in our interest to prevent the addition of nuclear weapons powers as much as we can do that. Now, since President Kennedy's time, several countries have become nuclear weapons powers against our wishes. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is international law, uh, says that there should only be five nuclear weapons powers, the five permanent members. Well, that's no longer the case. President Kennedy worried 50 odd years ago that there might be dozens of nuclear weapons powers. That's not the case. It's not quite as bad as people had feared. But proliferation, nuclear proliferation, chemical, biological, is something that we believe is of vital interest. And therefore, we're willing to do just about anything to prevent the worst from happening. And countries, governments tend to grade their interests, rate their interests. A vital interest is American English code word for something we will fight for or resist with all means possible. And certainly, um, if Israel has a nuclear weapons capability, Israel's never admitted it. If it did, we have such trust in Israel that it wouldn't use those weapons unless attacked. But that doesn't bother the United States. India's um, Ownership of nuclear weapons is something we've always opposed. We've never facilitated and never will. But we trust India not to use those weapons in an offensive way. We don't trust the government in Tehran. We wouldn't want to trust it with nuclear weapons. And therefore, Republican presidents and Democratic presidents have said about Iran, we will stop this. That's the Obama position. And that is the Bush position. And um, there's a consensus in Washington about this. I think we've been, we're on the road to possibly being successful by using negotiations and sanctions to accomplish that rather than the use of force. So that's, those are some of the criteria. If, a, if an interest is not vital, if it's merely important, you might not fight for it. You might not use sanctions to serve it. You can't sanction everybody because you're unhappy with lots of things, but you really reserve this for the Afrikaner, you know, the, the white regime in South Africa deserve the sanctions. The Iranians deserve the sanctions. And you know that when countries that are very dissimilar from all around the world join you in those sanctions, then you know that you've got universal approval for those sanctions. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, this question, uh, may not be uh, precisely germane to sanctions and divestments, but I do think it's germane to the broader issue of accountability. I'd like to go back to the American debacle in Iraq from 2003 to 2011 and just wonder whether you share at all, my sense of outrage and revulsion that there has been no accountability for the revelations in the T CIA torture report, that arguably what uh, Cheney and Bush did in lying to get us in there and with the, the subsequent consequences for um, violations of human rights at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and, and so-called black sites, uh, whether you consider those to be impeachable offenses, because I think it goes a little bit deeper than, oh, well, we just made a mistake. And um, I would say that for the, the post 9-11 environment generally, the violations of civil liberties, all of that, in a, in, a, in a piece, I, I guess I'm feeling a sense of frustration that in your perspective on, on Iraq, um, I'm not seeing those human rights issues and those constitutional issues being brought to the forefront. Thank you. Now, it's a fair question. Okay, because um, it's not on the sanctions issue. It's okay. So it's your, no, she, your it's a fair question. Okay. I, I'm happy to answer it. Um, difficult questions. Uh, I hope I didn't convey a sense of, well, we made some mistakes and it wasn't a big deal. When you invade a country and you divide the world over that and a lot of people get killed, Iraqi and American, it's a big deal. And I mean to convey that was a big mistake in my judgment. But I want to be honest with you. Uh, I supported it 
at the time, and I have to tell you that. And I've now concluded with the benefit of hindsight, which is easy, easier, that it was wrong. What was particularly wrong about it? Abu Ghraib was wrong. And torture was wrong. I, I, I'm with Senator McCain on torture. I believe that we should not torture. I believe that we have to be, we have to support the international conventions against torture. So I am very sorry and angry that our country engaged in that. I agree with you. But I'm, but I'm not prepared to say, having said that, that the entire enterprise was a complete failure because I think it wasn't. If you look at the entire enterprise from 03 to 08, we did, whether you agree with the invasion or not, we gave them a chance to have democratic elections that they'd never had, multiple democratic elections. When the policy was on the verge of a complete failure in 2006 and early 2007, President Bush, I think there would have been a democratic, a bipartisan consensus to leave Iraq. He did the hard thing. He stayed, he, he um, engineered the surge, and the surge worked to diminish violence and to create a safer country and a less violent country for the Iraqis. And it was very courageous because it was a huge gamble. And General Petraeus, I think, was brilliant in executing the surge. And as I said, I wish now that I'd been a louder voice as a private citizen in 2011 saying to a president whom I support, I support President Obama, I think we were wrong to leave in 2011. We should have stayed. We have to have patience. You can't go into these countries and turn them upside down and leave 10 years later. So Zaina asked a really good question. How do you learn from all this? Iraq and Afghanistan are dissimilar. You can't say that what works for one works for the other. But I think we ought to stay in Afghanistan. The policy right now is that we're going to leave completely by the end of 2016. I fear if we leave completely, we've been there 14 years. We've, you know, in terms of human life, commitment by American military, the commitment of the Afghans, if we leave now, 2016, I think the Taliban will take over several of the southern provinces and they'll divide the country again and they'll, they'll be an evil regime. And I use that word specifically. So you, I think we should make the hard choice and stay to help them. And if you do invade a country, and we've invaded both Iraq and Afghanistan, you have a responsibility not just to leave when it's hard, when the going gets tough. So this gets back to this conundrum of, I, I'm not trying to have, play it, have all, be all things to all people or have it both ways. I think there were major mistakes made in going in to Iraq, and I think it was a mistake coming out. One last thing, and here I wanted to, I have a lot of respect for President George W. Bush, a lot of respect for him, although I disagree with some of his policies. He did not lie to get us into that war, and I think that's pretty conclusive. He believed the intelligence that chemical weapons were present. It turns out the intelligence was wrong. It's a catastrophic intelligence failure. Um, One of the sure that Cheney suppressed intelligence revelations to the contrary and leaned on the CIA to get the, res the political results that he wanted? I don't know that to be the case. I don't know it to be I the case. I think compelling evidence that there is. And I'm not aware there is. I just want to say it's one thing to disagree. If you say that a president lied, that's a big accusation. I would disagree with you and would defend President Bush in the sense I think he acted. He thought he was doing the right thing, but obviously we were wrong about the presence in 2003 of chemical weapons. We know they were there in the late 80s because Saddam used them against the Kurds in Halabcha. And we know they were there in the 90s because the UN weapons inspectors found them, chemical weapons. But they had, he got rid of them. We didn't know it. And so the pretext for war was wrong. But it wasn't a lie, in my judgment, by President Bush. It was not a lie. OK, over here. Yes, I want to express my gratitude for this conference. There weren't many people here, but there was an abundance of thought. It was very reflective, dense with ideas. My question has to do with the North Korean negotiations. What went wrong? What would you have done differently? Well, yeah, and you, I think, I think um, both the Bush and Obama administrations believe they've learned a lesson from the two big negotiations with the North Koreans. The first was the agreed framework of 1994, President Clinton's agreement 
on the nuclear program when they did not have nuclear weapons at that time with the North Koreans. And then President George W. Bush's negotiation in 2006, 7, and 8. In both instances, the North Koreans made solemn obligations to us, to the Chinese, to the Russians, in the, in the latter one, six party, Russians, South Koreans, and Japanese. And in both instances, the North Koreans fundamentally violated their assurances and commitments, and they lied. And they've now created a nuclear weapons uh, program. They have nuclear weapons because they didn't meet the commitments they made. So I think the conclusion, as I read the Obama administration, is that they have no interest in negotiating a third agreement with this regime because they think it just won't be implemented, that there'll be zero trust. And since they already have nuclear weapons, the issue of inspections becomes almost, not mute, moot, but not as important. With Iran, I think that we've concluded, both parties in the United States, that you cannot trust the Iranian government either. It's consistently lied to the UN about its nuclear program. It said it did not have enrichment facilities. Well, the Europeans discovered one at Natanz in 2002 or three, and then the Americans, French, and British discovered Fordow, and President Obama made that public accusation in September 2009. In both cases, the Iranians said, oh yes, we forgot to tell all of you at the UN that we had these facilities. Right, they've been lying. In the case of Iran, then, one of the big issues for June 30, you saw it in Henry Kissinger and George Shultz's Wall Street Journal op-ed, you've seen it in a lot of the, President Obama's been talking about it, is we're not gonna trust them. So it's a play on President Reagan's words, don't trust, but verify. And so I think one of the criteria upon which President Obama's deal with Iran will be judged, and should be judged, is, are the inspection, is the inspections regime strong enough that when they do cheat, we'll be able to see it and have the ability to reimpose sanctions. That's the critical factor, I think, one of the two or three that Congress and the American people will look at. And President Obama's working hard at this, trying to get that verification regime really tight. So we've learned our lesson with the North Koreans, and we've applied it to the Iranian negotiation in a way. Can't trust them. Because if you have a rec if either government has a record of lying openly, well, you've got to take account of that. You'd be naive not to. And President Obama's not naive. I think he's pretty hard-headed uh, about the Iranians. I saw one more person coming for a question. I think we'll make that the, uh, the last sure. question of the afternoon. Go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. I think it's very in informative. I have two questions. And the first one is, you talk about the effectiveness of using sanctions almost as a substitute for force. So I wonder, do you see the need for international law like to regulate the use of sanctions? And the second question is, mm, I feel like in the most of the case for the United States, the national interest and human right always converge, always come together. In your practical experience, doesn't these two never collide? Like, or if they collide, how do you weigh weight, weight one um, over the other? We all want to hold the nations to the highest moral standards as often as possible, but I don't, uh, as a student in politics, I think it's more of realistic, so I wonder how do you think of that? Thank you. Those are two really fine, thoughtful questions. Thank you. Uh, on the first one, should sanctions be grounded in law? Yes, ideally. Gonna, the sanctions will be more durable if they're embedded in a country's law, legal system, the country sanctioning, but particularly the UN. Because the UN confers, if you will, legitimacy, political legitimacy, even moral legitimacy in a way. If the UN, if the whole world acts together in Chapter 7, that's the entire world speaking when you sanction a Sudan or sanction in Iran. It's powerful. But having, so I think it's ideal, but not always sufficient. Because uh, in 2005, excuse me, in 2006, seven and eight, in addition to the Security Council sanctions, the US began to impose unilateral financial sanctions on Iran, as did the EU. Now, this was not embedded in UN, uh, uh, the UN um, chapter seven, because the Russians and Chinese didn't want to go along with financial sanctions, but we felt that the sanctions passed by the UN were not strong enough 
to have an impact on Iranian thinking, and so we went a step beyond. It was not legally based in the UN. It had no UN mandate. These were laws passed by the US Congress or the European Parliament, so they were embedded in country and regional law, but not universal law, but I, I still think you can defend them because I think that they've been successful in getting Iran at the table in allowing us to think about diplomacy, not just the use of force. And your second question, do uh, the, the, the United States national interests and human rights always converge? If that's the way I read your question, the answer is no. To be honest with you, I think one of the most difficult sets of issues to balance are those, our, our, our commitment to human rights in American law and our allegiance to the UN to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to our own Constitution and Bill of Rights, versus our concrete military, economic, energy interests, for instance. So for instance, where might we fall down? Well, we support many autocratic governments in the Middle East because they're important to us for oil and gas, uh, energy reasons. They're important to us because they help us block Iran uh, or block radicalism. There's a trade-off there. These are human rights violators, some of them. And yet, most American administrations have sided mainly with those concrete interests versus an absolute commitment to the human interest. Doesn't mean we're not critical of the Saudis on the rights of women, for instance, or in the use of capital punishment, although the United States lives in a glass house when it comes to capital punishment and the death penalty of course, some of our states practice it, but not my state, Massachusetts, I'm happy to say. I'm opposed to death penalty. So there's trade-offs here. And this is a big debate. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the country. One of the big fissures in American foreign policy from the 18th century to this century is this balancing of human rights on the one hand, um, our democratic rights versus concrete real politic interests. Where did we get this wrong? because we have to learn from failure, Rwanda, April 1994. Uh, we chose not to intervene. The French chose not to intervene. Nigerians chose not to intervene. The UN chose not to intervene. And up to a million people died in a genocide because we didn't intervene, because, because we didn't recognize perhaps what was happening, but we turned away from what was happening. Uh, Bosnia. 250,000 people died between 91 and 95 until Srebrenica. And I think Srebrenica was a shock to us to see 8,000 men and boys killed in two or three days uh, in, um, in Srebrenica. I think that was the reason why we then went into Bosnia, used military force in September, October, and then Richard Holbrook engineered his brilliant diplomatic negotiation to end the war at the Dayton Peace Talks. So, we have been, I think, we struggle with this balance between human rights and our concrete interests. Sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we don't get it right. And it's a continual struggle for every American administration. And that's been true all the way back to the very first American administration. I would say it's one of the most difficult issues that we deal with in our foreign policy. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I think we've had an intellectually rich conference, uh, but I think we've ended on a high note, and I'm very grateful and express the thanks of the, uh, the organizer, Arian Mack, uh, to Nicholas Burns for uh, what I thought was a brilliant talk. Thank you.